Now, I'm very, very thankful that what I experienced was obviously just a very, very mild <clears throat> case of COVID. Um, but, I, you know, I also want to be sensitive because there's a whole lot of people who right now and before have gone through a not so mild uh, case of COVID. And so uh, I just want to be just mindful, uh, very thankful that I feel great. And just today I'm supposedly not contagious, but we're just taking extra precautions. But I miss you all. Oh my goodness, it's been, it seems like it's been forever, but didn't Pastor Alex do amazing? I'm just so, so thankful for him. And Father, we just thank you for your word. We thank you that we get to dive into your word today, that we can enjoy everything that you have to tell us. And we ask, Father, that you would just bless and anoint our ears in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So we have gone to, gotten now to the central focus of the book of Ruth. If, in fact, if you would turn, this isn't on the screen, but if you would turn to page 15 in your notes, going back to like the first week, you will see at the top of the page there that there is the chiastic structure. And if you'll notice the very center of it is chapter three, verses one through six. And the author is designed the whole structure of the book of Ruth this way so that our focus will hinge on this moment in the narrative, which is kind of a strange place for it to hinge on, but there are reasons for it and it has to do with what's at stake and the narrative patterning here and what we're supposed to see in ourselves. So today's very, very important. And I think that those of you who were able to just cancel all those vacation times just to be here tonight. Uh, I think you'll find it well worth it. But let's go right to the class notes section, and we're going to read through these six verses along with the, uh, and the red headings that tell us kind of what's happening here. And the first red heading is the justification for this scheme that is being concocted. Verse one, then her, talking about Ruth, her mother-in-law, Naomi, said to her, my daughter, shall I not seek security for you that it may go well for you? So here are the facts. Verse two, now then is Boaz not our relative with whose young women you were? Behold, he's winnowing barley at the threshing floor tonight. <clears throat> the directions. Wash yourself, therefore, and anoint yourself, and put on your clothes, fancy clothes, and go down to the threshing floor. Do not reveal yourself to the man until he's finished eating and drinking. And it shall be... When he lies down, you shall take notice of the place where he lies, and you shall go and uncover his feet and lie down, and then he'll tell you what you should do. Ruth's agreement, and she said to her, all that you say, I will do. So verse six, so she did. She went down to the threshing floor and did according to all that her mother-in-law had commanded her. Oh, there is so much going on here. Remember from week one, we talked about how earlier narratives in the Hebrew Bible teach us how to understand later ones and vice versa. The later ones help us to reflect back on some of the earlier ones and say, oh, I think I see what was happening here. So what we always want to do is listen for the theme music. And I'm not sure, you know, six, seven weeks ago when I was preparing the notes for this class, I was thinking that the perfect theme music for this is like the Jaws theme, you know, da, da, da. but there've been like shark attacks in the news lately. So, so whatever like villain theme you can come up with in your head, this is the theme that's playing in the minds of the ancient readers. They're like, uh-oh, 
Here we go again. There's a narrative pattern that has repeated often already, and it looks like it's happening again. If you remember like the first scheme in the Bible uh, that is presented by this serpent, talking snake who schemes and says, look, hasn't God said you can eat from any tree in the garden? It posed like a question, like I'm looking out for you. I'm looking out for you. And he deceived them with this idea that, you know, you'd be like God if you just take of this fruit. And so they were deceived. And the fruit was mislabeled, wasn't it? It wasn't actually the fruit of wisdom. It was the fruit of trying to do what's right in our own eyes. And they were deceived. We see this pattern occur again in Genesis chapter 12 when Abraham schemes against Pharaoh. In this case, Abraham is the deceiver. He's like, this is my sister. This is my sister. And so Pharaoh's like, well, fine. She's fair game then, I guess. This beautiful woman, Sarah. And then plagues start coming down on Egypt. Well, they are suffering consequences until Abraham figures out what's going, or the Pharaoh figures out what's going on. And he's like, why'd you do this? Well, you know, get out of here and take a bunch of stuff with you. Rachel, she schemes against Isaac when it's obvious that Isaac favors Esau, the, the technically oldest twin, and he's going to give him the blessing. He's going to give him the, the generational anointing. He's going to get He's basically going to be the privileged heir. And Rachel conspires with Yitz, with uh, Jacob, Yaakov, the heel grabber, to deceive Isaac. So same thing, hunger, a deceiver, misidentified son, and then being deceived. So you see is like the same pattern. And now we have the same type of thing happening again. Ruth chapter three, verses one through six it's the focal point of the entire book of Ruth because everything hinges on this moment in the text. And this is this tune, every reader's heard it. It portends disaster. So what curse, there people are wondering as they're hearing this for the first time, if any, will the embittered, faithless, but conflicted Israelite named Naomi gonna bring upon herself with all this scheming because it never ends well. Now I know you're, some of you are like, I've never really heard Ruth this way. Naomi is not supposed to be one of the villains. And I just want to remind you, she's not a villain. That most of the characters in the Bible are neither villains or heroes. Most of the characters in the Bible are mirrors. And Naomi is one giant mirror. Not only are we supposed to look at Naomi and what she's doing to try to make things right in her own scheming and mind and figure things out for herself and see us, right? But I think very much so. Israel, as they're reading this, is supposed to look and say, boy, that is the story of Israel, isn't it? For we have been given so much by God, just like Naomi was so blessed by the generosity of Boaz. And yet we continually scheme to do things that seem right in our own eyes. So another question is what manipulation will this kind but foreign daughter, Ruth, is she gonna succumb to? And then finally, the question that arises is how is this Torah observant man, Boaz, this man who obviously cares deeply about the instruction of God. He's a man of chesed, of loving kindness. He's a man of chen. He's a man of grace. How's he gonna respond to this temptation? Okay, so as we dive in, keep in mind, several weeks have passed since Ruth's encounter with Boaz in which he so generously gave to her. She's been gleaning the fields every day for weeks, bringing home lots and lots of food. But it's been a long time. And at least in the narrative world here, there have been no other encounters with Boaz. So what's going to happen? I mean, Naomi's got to be like, this is, how's the situation going to resolve? It started off well, but now 
There's no other contact. Ruth is gleaning in Boaz's fields with very favorable conditions. They likely have enough food at this point to last over a year between them. But what about after that? Naomi has no assurance that the abundance will continue past that year. And what about the land that belonged to her husband, Elimelech? Should Naomi use their grain to seed it or should she sell it? And there aren't a lot of options here. But most importantly, what about the line of Elimelech? And this is gonna come up a couple of weeks from now. You'll see how important it is and central to this story is really in the back of the minds of all the Israelite readers of this story in ancient times is they know King David had a Moabite in his ancestry. It's well known. This story seems to be telling the story of that ancestry. So they know what's really at stake here is the line, the line of David, the line that would lead to their king. And this line is hanging by a thread. Naomi is not bearing any more children. And Ruth, well, she's a Moabitess. So what about it? The house is broken because the line is broken. So a house, in biblically, a house is not a place with four walls. Biblically, a house is a lineage. A house is a place that has been given to you. It's, uh, it's a family that's been given to you by the Lord that will continue for generations. That's a house. That may include an estate and whatnot, but that's not really that important. That's why when we talk about the house of the Lord and from the perspective of the New Testament, it goes beyond even families and children to our brothers and sisters around us that we form a new house. See what I'm saying? It's the house of the Lord Jesus. Okay, verse one. Then her mother-in-law, Naomi, said to her, my daughter, shall I not seek security for you that it may go well for you? So Naomi is asserting here that the scheme she's about to explain is solely for the benefit of Ruth's future security and felicity, her happiness. That's all this is about. And she says, shall I not seek security for you? It's kind of an echo of an earlier question by another deceiver. Hath God not said you may eat of every tree in the garden? You see these questions that are supposedly in your favor start out. It's a biblical theme of deception. So both of these types of questions are designed to focus on the needs of the listener, not on the motives of the questioner. So that when it's a, it's a deceptive technique, that when you're asked something that way, you're thinking about yourself. You're not thinking about the person who's asking you the question, whether they have good or bad motives. And Naomi, well, maybe she has food for a year. What about after that? She's a childless widow carrying the baggage of an apparently barren Moabitess. What options does she have? She feels like she needs to take matters into her own hands. And when she says that it needs to go well with you, there's another concept very, very important to keep in mind as we read through Ruth. Ruth and Naomi are squarely in the ranks of the quartet of the vulnerable. We talked about this on week one a little bit. The quartet of the vulnerable in biblical literature is the widow, the orphan, the poor, and the foreigner. This shows up again and again and again in scripture, sometimes one or two of the four, sometimes all four together. But you see them in Deuteronomy are mentioned explicitly and often in the prophets. Amos talks a lot about these and how God cares so deeply about this quartet of the vulnerable and even more deeply about how his people are treating the quartet of the vulnerable. And this is Ruth and Naomi squarely. They're three of the four. If we look at what Tim Keller, Pastor Tim Keller is just an awesome pastor, uh, shares this from Generous Justice. It is striking to see how often God is introduced as the defender of these vulnerable groups. Don't miss the significance of this. 
Realize how significant it is that the biblical writers introduce God as a father to the fatherless, a defender of widows, Psalm 68. This is one of the main things he does in the world. He identifies with the powerless. He takes up their cause. From ancient times, the God of the Bible stood out from the gods of all other religions as a God on the side of the powerless and of justice for the poor. All right, so now that we have uh, the reasoning behind the scheme, let's look at what the facts are on the ground. Verse two, now then, is Boaz not our relative with whose young women you were? Behold, he's winnowing barley at the threshing floor tonight. So Naomi's saying here that since Boaz is a relative, he's fair game to be approached by Ruth. And since Ruth was already with Boaz's young women, Naomi figures that Boaz already considers Ruth a part of his crew, so she can approach him. And she says he's winnowing barley at the threshing floor tonight. This is soaked with implications uh, to an ancient reader, and I'm gonna clue you in. So what, what is threshing, first of all? Threshing involves throwing the grain up into the air so that the husks will separate from the kernel. So the husks end up floating away, that's the chaff, and the kernel falls back to the ground, that's the good stuff. Threshing floors were usually stony outcrops on hillsides where it was windy to assist with the chaff floating away. And the owners of the crop would usually send their workers home and they themselves would sleep by the mound of grain to guard it during the night because that was their wealth for the year. But because of this, this was a good uh, sales opportunity for prostitutes. Uh, in the ancient world, when it was that time of the threshing and the, and the wealthy owner of the big pile of grain was laying there sleeping, uh, often prostitutes would proposition the wealthy landowners. They're out there by themselves, middle of the night, nobody around, guarding a valuable mound of grain all night happy with themselves with the harvest. So it was a sales opportunity. So again, in the mind of the reader is, Naomi's sending Ruth out to the threshing floor under these circumstances. This is incredibly risky. This is incredibly morally ambiguous. And she doubles down, verse three, wash yourself therefore and anoint yourself and put on your fancy clothes and go down to the threshing floor. Don't reveal yourself to the man till he's finished eating and drinking. And it shall be when he lies down that you shall take notice of the place where he lies and you shall go and uncover his feet and lie down. Then he'll tell you what you should do. So this is a departure from the norm in biblical narrative. Normally in biblical narrative, it just skips along at this very fast pace. And often people say, you know, I wish it provided a little bit more detail. Like, you know, the fiction authors that we have today provide all this color and detail and description and what people look like. And, and biblical authors have a whole different strategy. It just skips along. But Sometimes it slows way down and gives you step by step. And that's what's happening here. The pace of the narrative slows to a crawl and every detail of Naomi's guidance is spelled out. And biblical authors do this when they want the reader to slow down and pay attention because some crucial event is underway. It's a clue. For example, uh, the same type of literary strategy of slowing things down is used in Genesis 22 as Abraham prepares to sacrifice Isaac. I mean, just the, the narrative just grinds to a halt and you get every little detail because you're supposed to just be in that moment and feel what's going on. Or in Genesis 24 at Laban's well, when Abraham's servant first meets Rebecca, that's such a critical moment in the story and every little detail is spelled out. The same thing's happening here. Wash, anoint, put on good clothes, go to the threshing floor. And these are similar to preparations one might make for a wedding night. 
There's just enough ambiguity in the language here to cause the reader to wonder if Naomi's directions are really truly seductive in nature. Or are they, is she just really naive? I mean, there's some ambiguity, but the theme music is loud and clear because again, the reader has read this sort of thing many times before. And then she says, and then until he's finished eating and drinking and when he lies down, this means when Boaz is in a relaxed and vulnerable state. So what this brings to the reader's minds, these Torah-soaked readers have already been soaked in the Bible. They're remembering Noah's drunken state in which Ham ridiculed his nakedness. They're remembering Lot's drunken state in which his own daughters seduced him, leading to the birth of Moab. And while Naomi doesn't say that Moaz will be drunk per se, the literary connection here is very, very strong. You're supposed to make this connection. And she says, you shall note the place he lies down and you shall go and uncover his feet and lie down. So a young Moabite woman washed, perfumed in her best clothing is to sneak up on a man from Bethlehem in the time of the judges in his sleep, after having a meal and a drink or two, lift his clothing to expose some of his body and do it at night when no one is around on a threshing floor. You see what's, what's building up in the reader's minds here is what is Naomi doing? For Pete's sake, what is she doing? Is she out of her mind? And then... Naomi just leaves it at that. She gives her no further instructions. She's like, well, then he's going to tell you what you should do. She's leaving it entirely in Boaz's hands at that point. Naomi gives no indication to Ruth what to expect after this, except that Boaz will tell her whatever he wants. So what are the options? What could possibly happen here? I know you all have read ahead. You know what happens. But just think about this from the perspective of not knowing what happens yet. One option the seemingly the most likely one, is that Boaz would succumb to temptation and have sex with Ruth. Remember that theme music? It's the same old pattern that's happened before. And then he'll either send her away or he'll feel obligated to her out of shame. Maybe Ruth would get pregnant, in which case Boaz would be entrapped to care for them. You see, there's some reasons behind this. And, and there's, there's even some uh, justification in terms of preserving the line in Naomi's mind, because after all, didn't Tamar do something similar with Judah when Judah you know, wasn't fulfilling his responsibilities to have her marry his surviving son in Genesis chapter 38? So she disguised herself as a prostitute and had sex with Judah, got pregnant. And then Judah, when he found out she was pregnant, he's gonna have her killed. But then he realized that he's the one that impregnated her. And he's like, you were more righteous than I. And this is like one of Elimelech's ancestors. And one of the ancestors of the tribe of the people living in Bethlehem. So is it in Naomi's mind? We're just gonna play that scene kind of over? That's option number one. Option number two, Boaz would send Ruth away in indignation. Say, oh, I could, why would you come here like this? I am a Yahweh following Torah observant man of God. So leave. This is wrong. And that's a significant possibility. Or third option, Boaz would somehow recognize Ruth as good wife material, even though she's a Moabitess apparently barren, poor, and the sort of person who sneaks under the threshing floor in the middle of the night, that he would marry her, take care of Naomi, and live happily ever after. This is so unlikely. You see what I'm saying? This is just like this option. Certainly not the way it's going now. The scheme is horribly risky and dangerous for Ruth, this young woman. It's dangerous for her. But what does she say? Verse five, and she said to her, speaking to Naomi, all that you say, 
I will do. So even though this scheme placed Ruth in the highly suspicious light, even though it meant considerable risk to her honor, she acquiesces to her mother. She doesn't even bring up any of a host of possible objections, like some of the ones that we just discussed. It's in her mind. She's very smart. She knows what's going on. But rather than say, now let's just slow down here. <laughs> let's slow down. Let's think this through. She says to her, all that you say, I will do. So I think the author of Ruth is inviting us not only to question Naomi's character for concocting the scheme in the first place, but is inviting us to question Ruth's character for so easily succumbing to it. And we're gonna find out next week exactly what Ruth does to flip the script here. Um, there's something very subtle, but very powerful that Ruth takes into her own hands. It doesn't go against anything that Naomi said, but uh, Ruth is using some wisdom next week. Genesis chapter four, verse seven. And this is God speaking to Cain. Cain is um, feeling envy towards his brother because he feels like his brother was treated much better than him unfairly by God. So he's upset, his face falls. And God says to Cain, if you do what is right, will you not be accepted? But if you do not do what is right, sin is crouching at your door. It desires to have you, but you must rule over it. And this is one of those moments for Ruth. Sin is crouching at the door. She's got this set of instructions that she's just agreed to. There's a incredibly risky circumstance she's placing herself into shortly. She's gonna do everything that her mother-in-law said. And sin is crouching at the door and it wants to devour her. This is a Cain moment. All right, uh, Rupert Hubbard <clears throat> has something very insightful to say from his commentary on Ruth. Ruth's simple, I will do, settle the arrangement and push the story forward. Once again, she showed herself devoted to Naomi, not by dissent as in chapter one, when she argued with her and says, I'm just gonna follow you no matter what, but by consent. The reader, however, learns nothing of her motives, fears, or expectations, nothing of her faith in God to prosper her efforts. Indeed, the theological question was, would human plans collide or coincide with God's plans? Would God bless the clever plan of Naomi the matchmaker? Or, as with Abraham's ill-fated move uh, with Hagar, annul it with a divine no. As the scene closed, the only certainty was that like Esther, Ruth would simply obey despite the dangers. She willingly cast her fate into Naomi's hands by going along with her plans. So uh, I would depart a little bit from Rupert Hubbard's uh, comments there by saying that Neo, uh, that Ruth already probably was thinking about how she was gonna carry this out in a way that was God honoring. So verse six, so she went down to the threshing floor and did according to all that her mother-in-law had commanded her. And then it gets spelled out in the following verses, which we'll see next week. But this verse here, verse six, is actually a transition from the hatching of the scheme and the way the scheme actually plays out. It functions as a dual role as both ending verses one through six, that unit there, and also as a heading for the very next scene. And the verse is a comment by the narrator to readers that whatever happens in the next scene, whatever's about to happen, which is probably quite different than what Naomi expected to happen, Ruth made good on her promise to Naomi. She keeps her promises. And as we find out next week, Ruth is able to find a way to both do right by Naomi and her morally ambiguous command, but also to do right by Boaz. It's just, this is just brilliant, the 
way it's set up here. So let's, let's look at how the first audience would be reacting to this central act and this central scene in the book of Ruth. I think, so just expectations. When you go to the grocery store and you walk into the aisle where they have all the pickles and the sauerkraut and the pickled goods and everything, you're expecting to pick up something sour, aren't you? Um, the last thing you expect is to get a jar of dill pickles and open it up and it tastes like, you know, Hershey's Kisses. The, see, and the grocery store that the biblical authors have trained the readers is this is the aisle where you get a sour outcome. This, this is the aisle in the store where things go bad. Uh, and you just, you just adjust your tastes and your expectations because this is what you're going to get. Uh, but I love how Ruth ends up flipping that script. But this is what everybody's expecting. The ancient reader would be wondering if Naomi could in any way have noble intentions in this instruction. Just like today, if you hear a lot of people talk about the book of Ruth, they work very hard to get around what's happening in, in these verses uh, to make Naomi look better. And I, I understand that. I respect that. I get it. You, you don't want to have this very important figure in a book of the Bible to be coming up with such a, a morally compromising scheme, especially when things kind of end well for the person. It just doesn't seem to match, you know, the whole uh, law of, of just rest, retribution kind of thing. No, you do something wrong, you get punished, you do something right, you get rewarded. And, and the author of Ruth just has no interest in that Author of Ruth is doing something completely different, and that is presenting a case of what happens to someone who is really messed up when they encounter the grace of God. And Naomi is really messed up. She's taken incredibly bad actions with her husband. She's abandoned the Lord. She's taken matters into her own hands. She's blamed him for her crises. She's called herself, re-identified herself as a bitter human being. And now she's deceiving Ruth with this scheme. And what does she run right up against? God's unfathomable grace. This is exactly what Israel is to expect from God, is God's unfathomable grace. This is really one of the main points of the book of Ruth. God's love is not to be overcome by evil. It's just not. He will find a way to reach you. Anyway, sorry, I was going into preaching there. Okay, the threshing floor in the dead of night, it's not a place for noble intentions. It just isn't. Or maybe they figure, is Naomi violating the Torah in an even worse way from Leviticus 19, where it says, do not profane your daughter by making her a prostitute so that the land does not fall into prostitution and the land does not become full of outrageous sin because it kind of seems like that's the direction she's heading. Again, the language is ambiguous, but in the minds of the readers, you can't help going there, especially in ancient times. By all accounts, Naomi, or I guess she prefers to be called Mara now, bitter, takes the initiative for the very first time in the narrative until now, she's just been kind of following along. Things have been happening, and she's just been kind of complaining about it. Even when uh, Ruth went to go glean in, in fields, instead of Naomi saying, hey, while you're out there gleaning, let me tell you about who's safe. She's just like, yeah, go ahead. I mean, puts her at incredible risk. It was by, quote, unquote, chance that Ruth came upon Boaz's field. It was God who intervened. Naomi had nothing to do with it. Naomi's surprised that she happened to run into Boaz, who happens to be one of their kinsmen redeemers. You see how she's just been carried along. Well, now she's taking the initiative, and when she does, she's taking it uh, in, in a ambiguous, morally ambiguous way. A bitter woman's schemes are not typically reflective of good intentions in the Hebrew Bible so far. 
And also the ancient reader would be thinking, Naomi seems to be using her foreign daughter-in-law in a way similar to the way Sarah used her Egyptian slave, Hagar. And that did not turn out well. So the tension has built, hasn't it? You see, you see what the author has done here is provided the setting and now has built the tension. And next week we see the resolution. And then there's another mini tension that is built in that is, uh, just leads to all kinds of explosions of life. But the author has built us to this point. We're kind of on the edge of a knife. It's like, how is Ruth gonna get out of this one? How is, we know that somehow David came from all of this. How could this be good? Maybe this messed up story explains his situation with him and Bathsheba. Maybe he got it from his great grandmother. I don't know. Well, we'll find out. So how do we reflect on this? Have you ever, or any of your friends, not you, your friends, have any of your friends ever gotten tired of waiting for God's promise and thought you might just help things along by taking matters into your own hands with some sort of plan that maybe it's not technically exactly morally right, but it could be worse. Have you ever had a friend who's done that? Have you ever been asked to do something maybe by someone who you pledged loyalty to, a spouse or uh, a boss. And this thing that you have been asked to do is risky to your reputation or is borderline on whether it's ethical. It's really borderline. Has that ever happened to you? And you see what the authors of scripture are doing. I want you to start to, to see the what we call the Old Testament, the Hebrew Bible in a whole new light. This is not, we're not just supposed to view characters in the Bible as models or as villains, but rather as mirrors. We're supposed to see ourselves. We're supposed to feel the tension of these decisions. We're supposed to look and say, my goodness, I, I, I can remember one time where it wasn't the same circumstances, of course, but I kind of felt like I was put in a similar position. And what did I do? Oh my goodness, I did this and it did not turn out well. Or maybe you think I was able to just get out of that situation somehow. But you're supposed to recount in your own life as you're reading this. And it's for the purpose of developing wisdom in us as we see what happens in the narrative. And what happens in this particular case is just so awesome. I'm so, can you tell I'm excited about next week? I am so excited about next week. It's like, I just want to talk about it already. All right, so we're going to hit the pause button here. And uh, can we give it up for our students? We want to thank them so much for being willing to share. And uh, normally this is when I would walk down there and sit with you. And this is just so awkward. I have to stand up here, but please, uh, I would like you to share any of your thoughts that you have from this section or from anything we've talked about so far. Just grab a mic. Someone has to be first. Mac. I think it's on. It's not on. <laughs> Try that one. And that one's not on. Yeah, we'll use Mariette's. Oh, the, test, test, test. Okay, well, they're on now. All right. <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> you know, uh, Pastor Tim, you give a extraordinary historical perspective of everything that we've that we've gone through. However, when I look at this, I, I try to find the relevance to today. And uh, you posed a question at the, at the end, and I wrote down in my notes something that, uh, that, that is really contemporary, and that is the end 
justifies the means. And uh, that is so unbiblical. But it caused me to also uh, think about uh, uh, something that happened to both me and my wife uh, some years ago while we were in Europe. Um, I think I was making $240 a month. And with that, I had to pay rent, groceries. And I saw some folks that just always had money. But they had money because they were taking the rations that we were, that we were given uh, for cigarettes, alcohol, things of that nature. They go buy it. They go up to young soldiers and say, uh, let me have your rations. And they pull all that stuff in their trunk and they go sell it to the Germans. And they just had a whole bunch of money. And I remember Sergeant Broussard was leaving the country and he wanted me to take over his business. And I saw the money that he was bringing in. And yep, I went to Colleen and I said, hey, baby, we, we can do this. You know, we ain't got to be buying money for groceries. And my wife said, uh-uh, we're not doing that. And uh, we turned it down and didn't do it. And, uh, and I felt better as a result. Uh, this uh, book of Ruth is just uh, fraught with, uh, with things that, that, that we can bring into the contemporary uh, uh, time frame. Um, that theme music, I'm sitting there thinking of the theme music to uh, Twitter. To what? Face, to Twitter and Facebook. Oh, I didn't know they had theme music. Oh, I... it's got those chirps that, that they have. Um, and uh, they are the deceiver. They are the deceiver. And we are living in a, uh, a politically charged environment where uh, we've got to be on the lookout for the deceivers. So it, it's, Ruth has got so much to tell us um, to um, uh, live in 2022. Thank you for that personal story. I, that, that definitely makes it so relevant. Yes, <laughs> makes it so relevant. And uh, thankful for Lady Wisdom to say, no, don't do that. Yep. Anyone else? I guess I, when, I, when I read it, uh, I'm, al I'm already jumping ahead, trying to figure out how's this gonna go because I've seen, we've seen countless times in the Bible where God has taken something that was meant for deception and trouble and for bad and turned it around. And, uh, and when I'm looking at the characters here, I see, you know, Naomi, who's bitter. Yes. Um, she thinks God's dealt her a bad hand. And, uh, and that she's using, I, I kind of wonder Ruth's mindset at that time, you know, was she, I mean, she was obviously, she was following Naomi, you know, and, and probably, you know, when you're around somebody with, that's got a lot of negativity, sometimes that wouldn't wear wear on you, you know, and you would tend to kind of go that way. And uh, it almost when she said, yeah, I'll do whatever you need, whatever you want. She was totally committed to Naomi and we're sitting at, and we're, re we're reading it and we're seeing it going so negative, you know, I mean, you know, it's because, it, you know, she was recognized as somebody who was kind of noble. I mean, Ruth, at that point, she was, she had left her country to follow Naomi and, and they respected that. But now, She's actually taking this person who has that and, and changing what somebody might see of her. And yet she's going to who we know is a man of God. Obviously, he's already shown her grace. And uh, so I find myself kind of at the edge of my seat wondering, how's this going to go? You know, I hear you. I mean, I even know how it's going to go. But I'm like, Ruth, <laughs> well, really you're misplacing <laughs> your loyalty. All right. Yeah. It, it, you just want to. Get, a, get her attention and say, no, don't do this. But, you know, I think one of the things that we're supposed to get out of this is that it's the kind of person Ruth is to stay loyal to someone and figure out how to do it in a way that honors God. And that's the hard road. That's a very hard road. It puts oneself at great risk. Um, but the character of this person from Moab, suddenly, I mean, you, you realize why the book is named after her. She is something special. And I think this is what the Israelite readers are invited to meditate on. 
is that she may be from the worst country. You may have all these discriminatory, you know, uh, ideas about who she is and what she's going to act like, but look at her character. Anyone else? So I guess we, we get to entertain questions. So I don't know. Maybe there aren't any questions today, and, and we all just relax and go to the cafe. So there are no questions that I have seen. On any oh, there really are there no really questions. Are no questions. <laughs> okay. Then it does, actually there is one question that I heard asked of Pastor Alex and he did an amazing job answering it, but I just wanna throw my two cents in. I think it was two weeks ago when someone asked about who the author of the book over, do you all remember that question? And he answered it perfectly. I just wanna give in my two cents about how authorship worked biblically and it's a little bit different than our modern Western ideas of what authorship means to us. Author is one person that sits down at a, you know, uh, I guess not a typewriter anymore, but you know, one person that sits down and writes out everything word for word, and that's how authorship works. Uh, but biblically, that is not how it works. In fact, we have examples in the Bible itself of how it actually works, and it's, it's a team. It's a team process. And you usually have somebody who's like the captain of the team. Like when Paul writes his letters, he's the captain of the writing team, obviously. Uh, he's the main driver of it, but he's got a team that is putting this together with him. And often at the ends of his letters, he'll say, this is from me, and he'll list other people that it's from. Uh, and then there's secretaries and editors involved and so on. And this is a tradition that they inherited from the <laughs> Hebrew Bible. This is how it worked. In the case of Ruth, uh, tradition ascribes the, the captain of the writing team to Samuel, to the judge Samuel, uh, which may or may not be true. It doesn't say that in the text itself. But if that's the case, then it is likely that maybe Samuel preserved this story, uh, which was then put together by, uh, again, part of his team. And it might've been a multi-generational team uh, to produce this thing hand in hand with the Holy Spirit that is just this literary masterpiece. So when you hear who is the author of this book, what I would just highly recommend is just shift your perspective to think in terms of, this was a team of people that was used by the Holy Spirit, much like God is using the church today. It's not just about elevating one person. It's about bringing us together. So that's, yes. I have a question. And now you have a question. Yes. <clears throat> I know. Um, as a widow, without any rights, uh, do you feel like Naomi had felt like she had to scheme to provide for she and Ruth because she couldn't mm. very well just walk up to Boaz and demand it? Yeah. So, uh, yeah, I think that that's kind of what we're invited to imagine here is that Naomi felt like she was kind of out of options. Was she really out of options? Could she have literally walked up to Boaz and said, I am Naomi, you've heard of me, you are my kinsman redeemer, can you help us? I mean, she could have done that. But uh, she felt that she could rely more on leveraging this beautiful young Moabite that Boaz seemed to take some kind of interest in and then leverage uh, what uh, men seem always to be willing to do to make things work out in her favor. That's the route she chose. It was the doing, not what is wise in God's eyes, but is what's wise in our own. But yeah, certainly she felt desperate to a certain degree. But the, again, remember the, the narrative has already told us that she's not in danger of starving anytime soon. God has graciously supplied through Boaz. There, she's in a situation of abundance here, but in her mind, it's still a situation of scarcity. You ever kind of been in a situation where God's really actually providing all your needs right now, or maybe not you, your friends, providing all your friends' needs right now, but your friend thinks, but how long is it gonna last? 
What about tomorrow? What about next week? What about next month? What about when this stops? What's going to happen to me? I've got to figure it out. And I think that's what she was doing. Okay. Yes. And I'll repeat the question. that he would have thought he had perhaps already lied with her? So um, the question is, when she is now going to go and lie down with him, uncover part of his body and lie down with him after he'd been eating and drinking, was it in Naomi's mind that uh, he's going to lie with her? He would awake. That he would awaken. And thought he maybe had already. And thought that maybe he had already... Uh, lied with her. I don't know. That's a good thought. I haven't thought about that one. Did he maybe wake up thinking, oh, I must have done something? Don't know. That's, I've never thought about that one. It's a good thought. All right. Okay. So um, Tim Keller is a neo-Calvinist. Uh-huh. Please tell me what does this mean to be a neo-Calvinist? <laughs> don't you love labels? <laughs> I hate to think what labels people would put on me. I don't know. Uh, Tim Keller is a, a Calvinist, is, follows generally the, the ideas of John Calvin uh, or Reformed theology when it comes to a person's salvation being all on the side of God and not on the side of man. And there's been a 500-year debate between Calvinism and non-Calvinism. And, and Tim Keller sort of is in the Calvinist camp, although he's kind of a modified Calvinist, he, not necessarily all five points, it gets very technical. What I have found is that Tim, when Tim Keller speaks on almost <coughs> every other issue other than those that touch upon the matters of uh, justification that Calvinism touches on, he's just got so much wisdom. So I'm not a throw the baby out with the bathwater kind of dude. If there's somebody that I may disagree with on certain points, fine points that are not crucial to our salvation. Uh, that doesn't mean that I stop listening to everything that they say. Uh, that's just my approach. In fact, most of the people I read, I wouldn't be able to read if I found anything that I disagreed with and then refused to read the rest of them. I think that it would be so sad, actually, to take that approach. But yeah, so but that's what it means. Um, Tim Keller falls on the side of Reformed theology. Okay. Doesn't Ruth show the representation of how God calls us to act in all situations, but the reader is the one truly tempted or tested here? Ah. Repeat that question. Doesn't Ruth show the representation of how God calls us to act in all situations, but the reader is the one truly tempted or tested here. Hmm. So uh, if I'm understanding the question right, could it be that Ruth, the, the author of Ruth and the Holy Spirit, are actually telling us this is how you are always supposed to act. This is a model situation, and it is uh, tempting for the reader to read into it that there's something else going on here. Um, I, I think that has been the traditional uh, position of some traditions in the Christian faith is to read anything that they read in the Bible if it seems like, wait a minute, this is like kind of freaky here, is to conform it into a box that says, nope, somehow this is all godly advice. Um, this story is godly advice and nothing else. And I, do, I, I just humbly disagree with that. I think that the biblical authors are not trying to always present us what we should always do. I definitely don't think that the author of Ruth wants us to put ourselves in a situation like Ruth is doing right now with Boaz. I do not think that the author of Ruth is encouraging to leave God's promise in time of famine uh, to uh, you know, a false land or encouraging sin. Uh, I just don't think that. But I do think that what we are supposed to see in Ruth is how God's character overcomes 
all these incredibly bad decisions and sometimes bad motives and how God's character always wins ultimately and flips the script. Um, okay. Yep. If I understood the question right. Even though Ruth was following Naomi's guidance, wouldn't Israelites see her actions as reflecting those of a Moabite woman? Um, yeah. Yes. Yeah. I think so. Although I think at this point in the narrative, people have got the idea that, that she's different, that she's not a typical, what they think of as a typical Moabitess. The person who's acting more like a Moabitess is the Israelite. Um, so I think that the ancient readers got that. I think the ancient readers got that. And the last one, where do you think Ruth got her moral foundation? Hmm. Yeah, that's a, that's a good question, isn't it? So I think what this is, please, uh, another 10 years of reflection, and I'll, I'll give you more. But I think what the author is inviting us into is that Ruth's pledge to follow Naomi's God was the key. And she did learn, obviously, about Yahweh. She spent 10 years married to an Israelite. She knows. But her pledge of following, that that was this, uh, an act of faith that really made a difference in Ruth's life and heart. The, there was another one about when's the next Bible study and what is it? Okay. Yeah, you sure have one you want to the that. next Bible study will be in the fall, uh, I think middle of August. It's going to be a New Testament book. I'm, I'm not going to tell you what it is yet, but I do think everybody's going to be very excited about it. And I love you guys. Thank you so much for being here tonight. Thank you, Pastor Tim. Don't you appreciate him for coming in? Sick. I know I'm not supposed to be near him. Um, <laughs> And writing all the lessons. That was a weird fly. Um, okay, so I know there's been some questions about emails not getting there and that kind of thing. Again, I'm sorry, but I'll be in the back. So any questions you need or additional lessons or what have you, we will be back there, okay? Thank you, and we'll see you next Wednesday.